Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Tara Vansel, and this is a talk called Learning to Love JavaScript. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why any of you are here when <laughs> there are so many other great talks uh, going on right now. But in any case, thank you for being here. I'm very happy to see you all. Um, and I hope that this will be a worthwhile talk. Um, maybe you're here because you love JavaScript and want to affirm your feelings. Maybe you've recently had some bad thoughts about JavaScript and are seeking redemption. Uh, or, or maybe you're just a full-blown JavaScript hater and you're here in anticipation of a rowdy Q&A session. <laughs> Those are all valid reasons to be here, except uh, there will not be a Q&A session today. <laughs> um, the organizers gave me the option to spend the last 10 minutes doing Q&A or talking at you for an extra 10 minutes. And because I have very little interest in debating the merits of any programming language, especially not JavaScript, um, and also because I like to talk, I'm going to talk for 40 minutes. And if I don't talk for 40 minutes, we might do a Q&A, and that will be my punishment for, uh, for not filling the whole slot. So <laughs> here we go. Um, with that said, if you do have questions uh, at some point during the presentation, please do not interrupt me. And please save your questions for never. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally kidding. You can talk to me anytime during the conference. I'm, I'm, I'm just nervous. <laughs> so <laughs> Q&A is especially nerve wracking. So um, as I noted in the, in the abstract, and you might have seen in the program, you should walk away from this talk having a deeper appreciation for the feat of human cooperation that is the World Wide Web and how JavaScript became one of its most important threats. However, you will not walk away having heard any clever opinions about testing, writing, deploying, and monitoring code, and you also won't learn any new design patterns that you can take back to work next week. So if you're here at Strange Loop because you're eager to be, become a better software practitioner, uh, this talk might not be the best use of your time. And I, I genuinely will not be offended if you decide to leave now or at any point during the talk. Um, and while I do think as software practitioners, it's critically important for us to understand uh, the historical context with, uh, that our industry came out of, and I think this talk will be worth your time, uh, I might also recommend <laughs> another talk that's going on right now uh, for the folks in the room who are here to, uh, because they want to take away, uh, uh, they want to learn something practical and take it back to work. I, I might recommend the observability talk happening, happening in the other venue. Uh, Christine Yen is giving that talk, and she is the co-founder of Honeycomb. Uh, Honeycomb does some really cool work around observability, and uh, observability is a concept, a set of practices and goalposts around monitoring our code um, and, and building better monitoring tooling so we can understand when things go wrong and when they go right. Um, it should be a really great talk. Uh, so, while I give folks a chance to decide if they want to stay or not, uh, let me tell you a little bit about who I am and why you might be interested in lis listening to me give this talk. So hi, I'm Tara Vansel. This is me. Uh, I'm a software engineer. You can find me online in far too many places. Um, I live and work in New York City. Uh, this is by far the most boring introductory, introductory slide I've ever done. Um, but it, it, it really does fit for where I'm at in my life. I actually moved across the country from Texas to New York City this spring by myself. So my identity this summer has really revolved around surviving in New York City. Uh, <laughs> so this is, really, this is really who I am right now. Thank you for listening. Um, I haven't had much time for hobbies this summer, uh, but one, I have had time for my one hobby that, that, that um, I always make time for, which is doing nails. I'm obsessed with nails. Um, I actually have a full-blown professional nail salon. Not really a salon, but you know what I mean. In my bedroom, okay? So um, <laughs> if you're interested in nails, if you have questions about like how to talk to your manicurist, what to ask for, uh, definitely talk to me. I, I know more than I ought to about nails. 
Okay, so I said I'm a software engineer, and that can mean a million different things. What that means for me is that I get paid to write and maintain JavaScript, Node, CSS, HTML. Sometimes I work with CSS. Uh, more often than I like, I work with Webpack. Sometimes I write bash scripts. And honestly, a lot of the time, I write Slack messages. Um, who knew that writing software uh, involves talking to people? What a concept. <laughs> Uh, but I want to highlight the technologies I work with every day because I'm really proud to say that I work on the web. I have chosen the web platform as my stack. Um, that's not to say that I couldn't, uh, couldn't be an infrastructure engineer or I couldn't learn you know, about Haskell or Lisp or whatever. It's just that I love the web and what it stands for. And I think it's such a f phenomenal platform for building things on. Um, and this is a big part of who I am and why I'm interested in giving this talk. Um, I'm really lucky to work at a place called Glitch that feels the same way about the web. Um, Glitch is a company that came out of Fog Creek, which is the, is the company that made Stack Overflow and Trello. So it has this long history of helping folks build stuff on the web. And I'm really proud of Glitch for uh, maintaining that legacy today. It's kind of tricky to explain what Glitch is, um, but I, I mostly like to highlight that it's a code editor, um, a code editor in the browser that lets you collaborate with folks just like you would with Google Docs um, and deploys your app as you type. So the example that you see in this video is a simple web page, but you can build entire applications with backends on Glitch as well. So we support Node.js, and if you're, if you're uh, creative and ambitious, you can probably get it to support some other languages too. So I think Glitch is just like this super cool thing that enables folks um, of all skill levels to build on the web, and I'm really proud to be there. Uh, this talk is not about Glitch, and I, uh, I should say, even though I will mention it a few times in this talk, they're not paying me. Um, I mean, like, they're paying me to do my job, but they're not paying me to talk <laughs> about Glitch. I don't write code for free, and you shouldn't either. <laughs> Before I worked at Glitch, I worked on a project, a two-person team, uh, I worked on a project called the Beaker Browser. Um, Beaker was a weird project, but it was really cool. It was a browser. Uh, yeah, two people made a browser. Ew, what a concept. Um, we built this browser with Electron, so we weren't you know, building the innards of, a, of, a, of the browser from the ground up. We were leaning on Chromium, we were leaning on the folks on the Electron team who did all this found, uh, fundamental work to uh, make it possible to build a browser with JavaScript and HTML and CSS and Node. It's really weird. Um, but we, we, we built a browser because we wanted to run some experiments. Uh, we, the two of us who worked on it, we love the web, and we think the web is mostly great, but it's got some problems. And because we were just two people in, a, in an apartment, we didn't really have any uh, power to leverage with standards bodies. Uh, so we thought, well, what if we just change the web and make it work the way we want it to? So we did. The main experiment that we ran was to put a peer-to-peer -peer protocol in the browser. Um, the technical details don't really mat matter here. What matters is what the end result was. The end result was that we were able to make it easier for folks to click one button and publish a website from the browser. And we, we even built an in-browser editor to edit those websites. So it's very similar to Glitch. Um, and uh, it's, it's not a coincidence that I've worked on two projects in a row that uh, help folks publish uh, and edit websites. Um, and it's, I say it's not a coincidence because it's actually been very intentional. Um, I started building on the web in a period where uh, it wasn't that easy to publish websites. Um, GeoCity, uh, yeah, GeoCities had long gone. It had been shut down and taken like 30 million some odd websites with it. Um, and Glitch didn't exist yet, Now didn't exist yet, neither did Netlify. So when I was learning how to code on the web, I struggled to publish the things I was building on my local machine. And I felt that very deeply. Um, so I had, to, I had to learn how to like set up 
AWS and use Heroku and all these things that a newbie programmer probably shouldn't have to do when they're just trying to, to learn the fundamentals of base, uh, JavaScript. But I did it. So when I, you know, years later, I, I walk away feeling very certain that it's important to take as many barriers away for folks to participate on the web. And so that's why I've, uh, I'm so proud of the work that I did on Beaker and so proud to be uh, working at Glitch. If you'll let me get a little bit sentimental, uh, if I haven't already, <laughs> uh, if you'll let me get a little bit sentimental, I want to spend some time reflecting on what the web is. And, and I want to do it on a really grand scale. And I especially want to reflect on uh, the values that are encoded into the web, whether they were intentional or accidental, um, because they play a really big part in the argument that I'm going to try to make about why JavaScript is so great. So, if you think of it on the grandest, longest scale, uh, the web is sort of like, it's the apex of human communication. Just like the radio or telegrams or telephones were once the pinnacle of how we talk to each other as, as humans, I think of the web as the apex of human communication today. Um, we have this shared set of standards for getting information from one computer to another. That's pretty cool. Uh, if, we, if we break it down into uh, get into the more technical details, you might say that the web is a standardized set of tools for transmitting and interacting with documents. And the word tools is broad here. We're talking about uh, the languages that make up the web, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. We're talking about browsers and the, the, the protocols that they've all agreed to um, implement in mostly the same way. We're talking about the bodies, uh, the standards bodies that help shape these uh, specifications like the W3C and the WhatWG. It's massive, the web is massive, and there's, there's really no end to, um, where, there's, it's hard to say where the web begins and where the web ends. But what's important to note is that we've all agreed to use these same tools. So to summarize it, I like to say that the web is humanity's shared language. Think about that for a second. We actually have a shared language for, our, for, for specifying how our computers should talk to each other. That is profound. It's messy, but it's profound. And I think we shouldn't take it for granted. I think we really have to appreciate that this is an incredible feat of human cooperation, an enormous collective effort to build something that, that uh, serves us all. Um, and if, if you step back for a moment and think about how bad humans are at cooperating with each other. It's a goddamn miracle that the web is even here today. <laughs> I also like to talk about the, the values that are uh, encoded into the web. And some of these were on purpose and some of them were accidental. Um, the first is that the web is open. That means anybody can participate. You don't have to pay a fee. You don't have to ask for permission. To publish a website, all you need to do is follow the rules. Speak the language of the web, and you are welcome to participate. Um, that doesn't mean it's always easy. You know, uh, like I said, setting up servers and running servers is not easy. That's why many of you in this room get paid a lot of money to do it. Um, learning HTML is not even easy. It might seem easy to some of us in this room because we've been working with HTML for a long time, but it's not simple. It takes effort. But it's important to know that anybody can participate if they so choose. The web is also decentralized, which means it doesn't belong to any one party, not a government, not Apple, not Google. Um, well, Apple, Google, and some other large corporations do have an outsized influence on how it works and how it evolves through standards bodies, but they don't own it. We don't have to pay Google 10 cents to decode every web page we visit. Um, we do see a lot of ads, and they're largely to blame for that. But still, um, the, the, the promise of um, shared participation in this, in this platform is there. And lastly, the web is shared. Because it doesn't belong to any one party, it belongs to all of us. And 
that's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it belongs to all of us, which means that it's also our shared responsibility to protect it, to preserve it, to deal with all of its quirks and its uh, inconveniences, and to fix it. Sorry. <laughs> so, I want to move into the next part of the talk where I'm going to try to convince you that even though JavaScript has flaws, even though it's far from perfect, uh, that it's actually okay and to be expected. And I think, arguably, even part of the reason JavaScript has been so successful. So before I do that, I want to set some, some uh, expectations about how I'm going to approach this argument. And I hope you'll all come along with me. So I hope we can all agree that JavaScript is an imperfect programming language. All programming languages are imperfect. JavaScript may be a bit more than the rest, um, but it's fine. I hope we can also agree that the web is a miracle and we ought to preserve it. Um, just like democracy is a, a miracle of human cooperation and we have to fight for it every single day, uh, we have to fight for the web every single day. Lastly, it's not that serious. <laughs> Debates about programming languages are all in good fun, especially in spaces like this, spaces that are dedicated to, um, you know, grappling with each other over the, the intricacies of the tools we work with. But outside of this space, debates about programming languages are secondary to what we build and who we're building for. So I would just like us to keep that in mind. And if we do end up having time for Q&A, especially keep this part in mind, be nice. <laughs> Okay, so my first argument is that it doesn't make sense to judge JavaScript in a vacuum. To judge JavaScript solely on the merits of, uh, 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 its merits solely as a programming language is to miss the point. And to accurately weigh its place in the world, you have to consider JavaScript between type, scope, and syntax. In fact, I'm not even gonna talk about the intricacies of what's wrong with JavaScript in this talk because I don't think it matters. What matters is that the web is the context in which JavaScript operates. The web is a social space. Uh, and because it's a social space, it's a political space. So it's really wasting our time to be arguing about uh, uh, the mistakes that Brendan Eich might have made in the 10 days that he wrote JavaScript um, because it's a, we're, we're stuck with it. Um, we have made our bed, we have to lie in it, and we can't get rid of JavaScript. Um, if we got rid of JavaScript, we might have to, uh, ex we would have to accept that web pages from 1990 and earlier and after would not work. And I think that's something, thankfully, we've, we're not willing to give up about the web. And the second thing I wanna argue today is that JavaScript's success is in part due to its flaws. So JavaScript, if you don't know, it's the most popular programming language in the world, and it continues to grow year after year. Um, in isolation, its warts might make it seem like it's kind of crummy, but in reality, they're part of why it's been successful. So this is data from Stack Overflow's 2019 developer survey. This is not like the holy source of truth about programmers and the tools that they use, but I think it's a pretty telling set of data. Um, so all respondents said that, out of all respondents, 67.8% of them said that they are using JavaScript. Um, and only second behind that is HTML and CSS, which is also part of the web. So, JavaScript is here to stay. I mean, even if these even if these numbers aren't totally accurate, it makes sense to me that like tons of programmers and non-professional programmers alike are using JavaScript. It's everywhere. It's on your phones, it's in every browser, it's in your refrigerators, it is in spreadsheets. Um, I'm I mean, like where isn't JavaScript, I would ask. So it makes sense that it would be this popular. Um, and I, I want to reiterate that JavaScript was written in 10 days, so it's going to have some problems. And this is, I'm, this is why I don't really want to get into the, uh, the nitty-gritty details of what's wrong with JavaScript. I think those of us in this room probably know. Um, it doesn't have uh, strong support for, um, for those of you who are into types, like JavaScript is not your thing. Um, 
comparing null and strings, it's like things get ugly really fast, right? And we've learned, <laughs> we've learned to work around it uh, since JavaScript was created because we had to. It was written in 10 days, Brendan Eich made our bed, and here we are. We couldn't get rid of it because people were using it. We made a promise to ourselves and to, to the future, to, to future humanity that we were gonna make the web work for a long time. But that doesn't mean we can't fix those problems. Um, JavaScript does have unusual constraints in that there are tons of different uh, clients implementing JavaScript and sometimes choosing to deviate from the, from the specifications. Maybe they deviate from the specifications because, um, well, they're Google and they have outsized influence on um, the web and they have a ton of users. Um, maybe a browser, uh, a browser vendor just doesn't have the resources to implement um, a specification on the timeline that they would like. So I think we have to be patient with JavaScript. And when we, f when we uh, get frustrated with its uh, drawbacks, that we understand that they can be fixed. It will just take time, and it will probably be messier than we'd like. So I would like to propose a thought experiment. And I would like, I would like to ask, what if instead of JavaScript, the web used Haskell? <laughs> Seriously, like, can you imagine? Would the web have become the canvas for creativity that it is today? Uh, would it be used in schools to introduce kids to programming? Would we see the, see, see the same shared commitment to pre preserving this beautiful collective space we have? I would like to argue, no. <laughs> I think it's important that you can pick up JavaScript and make mistakes with it. I think it's critical that you can start typing in an HTML file and see the changes live right away in your browser. I don't want to give that up, even though it does sometimes make my job harder. Um, people are very mean to JavaScript online. It's sad. Like, I got really sad doing research for this talk. <laughs> um, you know, there's folks on Stack Overflow and Quora and all the other forums just I think taking their frustrations about JavaScript out on the people who choose to build, uh, work with JavaScript in their lives, people who are putting food on the table for their families and helping build their communities with the money they make writing JavaScript. I'm one of them, so I take it a little bit personally. Um, but as a professional, I know how to work around the shortcomings of JavaScript. Um, we've spent decades professionalizing this industry, and it's just really not fair to say that um, JavaScript is a bad language. And I don't think we would, we would want a better language to take its place anyway, because I think the web would be a much sadder place. Um, I want to highlight something that Tim Berners-Lee wrote in 1998. Uh, he coined this term called the principle of least power. Well, I'm not sure if he coined it, but he at least used it. And uh, in this document, he talked about how, it, how important, how he felt it was so important to make sure that we make our languages on the web um, not as powerful as possible, but to pick the least powerful solution uh, that works. So he was actually writing this document about HTML, and he was uh, communicating why he chose to um, make HTML so simple and declarative. And he wasn't specifically speaking to JavaScript at this point, but um, I, think it's, I think it really holds up when we talk about how uh, when, you, when you pick the least powerful but effective solution, you make sure that you keep the gates open for um, a, wide, a, a wide variety of folks. Uh, many years later, Jeff Atwood, um, <laughs> yeah. So Jeff Atwood was reflecting on this, this thing that Tim Berners-Lee wrote, and he interpreted uh, the principle of least power, uh, reinterpreted it, and just said that any application that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. I read this blog post of his, I truly don't follow how he got to this, even though I agree with him. I think like it, time has proven that any application that could be written in JavaScript will 
it will be done. Um, I don't know how he got there. I agree with him. I just wanted him to roast him because he's being a dingus on the internet right now. Um, so yeah, so Jeff Atwood doesn't understand the desire to unionize in technology. Why should you rich people unionize? You're all rich, right? Um, no, most tech workers are not rich. Most tech workers aren't even programmers. Also, collective action is a really powerful tool that demands executives act in the best interest of the planet and the people who live on it. Your boss doesn't love you. The good times might not last and you should go to techworkerscoalition.org. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So the web is a mess, but that's to be expected. The web is one of the weirdest, strangest things that humanity has ever done, but it's beautiful and we have to protect it. And even though it's a mess, I think it's really important to highlight our successes, to remember that it doesn't all suck out there. Like, there's a lot of really talented people, probably some of you in this room, who are putting their lives and their effort and their energy towards making the web better. Um, and maybe, like, you don't, have to, you don't have to commit your life to, like, improving the web, but um, I do ask that, like, whatever you do with the web or with code, like, just don't be evil, please. Um, so, yeah, I want to highlight some of the amazing things that have happened on the web. Um, Big int. We're going to be able to like do better math in JavaScript soon. So this is still um, this is still in the works. Um, like I said, JavaScript moves slow because you have a bunch of invested parties that have to agree and argue and then disagree and maybe agree later. So this stuff takes time. Um, but it's happening, right? Like this is going to be really huge. Right now, in order to do um, and to do like uh, uh, financial mathematics and whatever, I don't know, I'm not in finance. Uh, <laughs> um, like there's, we have to use external libraries. Folks have to use external libraries and um, people have opinions about external libraries and JavaScript. Um, I think one of the chief complaints I read while re researching this talk is that apps are bloated. Well, cool, uh, people who work in finance are gonna be able to remove those library, libraries, reduce parse and compile time, and it's gonna be great. Uh, then JavaScript will finally be perfect. I wanna also talk about Let's Encrypt. Um, I think this is one of the most important things to happen on the web in a really long time. So um, it feels like a long time ago that Let's Encrypt got started. Um, for those of you who don't know, it is a free automated transparent certificate authority run for the public's benefit. And what that means is that you now can get uh, a TLS certificate for free. Um, they have really great ways, tools for automating, uh, uh, renewing those certificates. And, and what this means in practice is that a ton more people are um, deploying their websites with HTTPS. And that means that uh, websites are less prone to being um, manipulated uh, by jerks or uh, nation states or anyone just trying to do nefarious things. Um, and I just think this is so cool. Like, it's free, they're, they're explicitly committed to, um, to, to making it free and transparent and, and to, to benefit the collective that is the web. And finally, just all of the cool shit that's being built on the web every single day. Seriously, there's so much of it. So I, I have a really hard time jo uh, tolerating JavaScript hatred because I see people every day in my work, especially at Glitch, building beautiful, amazing things. Sometimes they're weird and funny, sometimes they're actually useful, but no matter what, they're important to somebody, and I think that's really special. Um, so if, if you'll allow me, I do just like, want to highlight uh, some of these projects because they are so cool. So, um, <laughs> you can get a picture of Spider-Man. Uh, cool, yeah, that's, oh, that's a good one. That's from uh, the, uh, the Spider-Verse, which is like one of the best Spider-Mans ever. I want to see Tom Holland. Where is he at? Nope, nope, nope. Oh, wow. Did they leave out the best Spider-Man? They might have. Okay, well, carry on. Uh, this is another amazing project that was built on Glitch. Um, this person did some really amazing stuff where you can uh, give the app access to your camera and it will check your posture and blur your screen when your posture looks bad. So um, let's, I don't, I don't know what standing posture should look like. Um, 
Ah, it's blurry. So I guess I'm like hunching my shoulders. Okay. I don't think you can have good posture when standing. I guess that's, I guess that's how it works. And then finally, <laughs> soul patch, the upside down soul patch. This is um, my coworker Cassie's cat. Uh, Cassie made this amazing web ring for pets on Glitch. Um, and this just highlights to me like the weird and wonderful nature of what JavaScript and the web allows. Um, like, okay, I'm gonna see if I can, here we go. Let's, let's go to a random, another random pet website because Gosh, pets are so good. Oh, the app has to wake up. It's tired. Me too. Um, while we're waiting for that to wake up, why don't I show you uh, this really cool Wikipedia game. Uh, a lot of folks have been making games on Glitch. Sometimes they're like lo-fi, sometimes they're actually real proper games. I love this one. It's, um, it's like a follow, follow the uh, thread for Wikipedia. You Start with one term, and you have to get to another term, and you know a certain amount of uh, attempts. So um, let's do it. The Undertaker. Oh wow. Uh, I don't. Does anybody know what the Undertaker is? Is that a wrestling thing? Oh yeah, it's got to be. Okay. Okay, we got to get to basketball. Uh, sp sports entertainment. That's easy enough. Uh, did you say Dennis Rod? Okay, I, I hear Harlem Globetrotters. Oh yeah, here we go, here we go. <laughs> but, oh, second row, boom, we've done it. So, okay. Um, let's, let's try this again. I, I'm really hoping we get uh, Louie. Louie is my other coworker's pet, it's a dog. Oh no, this is a cat, cat reviews of toys. Adorable. <laughs> okay, so people are building stuff on the web, and you can, choose to, you can choose to criticize JavaScript on its merits, that's fine, but please keep your criticisms to the forums where they're appropriate. Um, looking down on folks who decide to build web apps is, it's just mean, it's boring, not interesting, find something better to do with your time, please. Um, and also, if you, if you are someone who's really into programming languages and you have opinions and you have the skills, I encourage you to get involved. This is, uh, the web is a shared effort and we need all the help that we can get to make it better. Um, TC39 is the body that um, defines ECMAScript, which is the specification that all the different browsers and uh, um, like VA and all, all the folks who implement JavaScript, this is the specification they're working off of. And there's some really amazing smart folks working here and I, I seriously encourage you to consider um, participating if, if you have concerns about JavaScript. Okay, I wanna close with um, the title of a chapter uh, of a book called Beautiful JavaScript, written by my boss, Jen Schiffer, uh, called One World, One Language. And if you know Jen, you know she's a bit of a jokester, but she's really, I think she's really serious here. One world, one love, one language, whatever. Um, and I think this to me encapsulates so much what I feel about JavaScript, which is that it is precious. It's seriously so precious because of where it sits in our shared experience. Um, learn to love it or eat its dust, honestly. Thank you. <laughs>
I don't, I don't know how to manage my time. I also built, I also built a full-blown emoji picker for this damn thing. So like, you know, it, you can actually like change the skin color. Um, by the way, GitHub doesn't even do this. I do. So um, get it together, GitHub. <sighs> I built a lot of stupid stuff, but that's fine. I'm allowed to. Okay, uh, we have, yeah, we have a little bit more time. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really read JavaScript books. I, I honestly learned from MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network. That's like my favorite JavaScript website ever because it's also an open source website. Anyone can contribute and also they have a proper team dedicated to maintaining it. Um, so just like read those pages. They, they do a good job of balancing technical, like just reiterating what the specification is about, uh, let's say, arrays. Um, but they also do an amazing job of providing tutorials that step you through how to, how to actually use the Fetch API or how to actually, uh, you know, turn on your camera, the, the user's camera in an app. It's great. No more questions? Oh, yeah, one more. What are my thoughts on Wasm? I think it's dope. I think it's so cool. Uh, I have, I don't know anything like about how to write it, but I know people that I really respect are super excited about it because it, um, it, it, it allow, it, it cooperates with the web, right? It's, it's not changing the web, it's not breaking the web, it's just saying, hey, let's make the web more powerful. So I'm all for it. Um, in fact, if there are any Wasm talks here uh, today or tomorrow, I definitely will be going. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming.